And so there was a, a, qu- a question during the break about heavy. There's there's a region that's allowed where the heavy Higgs boson. The, sorry, sorry, the uh, standard model like Higgs boson could be greater than about 400, 430 GeV from uh, from collider data. And if uh, if it turns out that the Higgs mass is above that, then what would that mean for supersymmetry? Well, I've uh, I've got a model in my coat pocket here that I can uh, pull out and. And you can make it work. And during the discussion time, uh, I, I can talk about sort of very heavy Higgs bosons, uh, standard model like Higgs boson within the supersymmetric context. There's a, there's a very interesting story there that we can discuss. And um, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's interesting from a theory point of view, not just a phenomenological point of view. It has a profound effect. To, on what you think is possible at a high scale, in fact. And, and the, the discussion section, is it, is it fixed where it will be? Is it? Uh... Yeah, I think we'll have this here. OK. So my discussion session tonight at 5, I believe it is. Yeah, at 5, will be in this room. And then there's uh, another one, uh, which is you know, Marcus. Uh, yeah, so just. So uh, there's a slight change from what's on the web, if you've, if you've noticed what's on the web, because uh, the room originally, originally booked is about a five, ten minute walk away, and I figured it's too cold for anybody to walk that far. So we'll just have um, James' session here, and then Marcus' session will be in the theory um, uh, conference room, which is above the conference secretariat. Yeah, mm-hmm. that's, five. that's at five o'clock, I think. At five o'clock, all right. Okay, good. So, uh, so the, 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 you thought this guy was a really tough guy that first morning, right? He, uh, but he's he's being kind to you and making you not have to walk outside. Okay. I was even scared when you said that you'd leave everybody behind tomorrow. So, uh, and I will. And he will. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. So. Uh, Gauge coupling unification. I, I, we talked about that in the last lecture briefly. They all work. It works very nicely within supersymmetry, and that is a major story in SUSE phenomenology and SUSE theory model building. Less s- talked about, but uh, but nevertheless, a huge literature and uh, interesting literature is gauge as Yukawa coupling unification. Uh, so. Uh, of course, as we know, gauge coupling unification implies that our low-scale theory is unified somehow. Either there's some kind of string unification, orbifold gut, simple grand unified group like SU5 or SO10, something. Uh, SO10, I, in my view, is, a, is an especially powerful uh, group uh, because all matter multiplets fit nicely within the 16 representation. And this uh, long lost right handed neutrino fits, uh, rounds it out. So I think uh, that, that looks uh, very appealing. And the simplest model approach in an SU, SO10 is to have the third generation 16 coupled with the, the 10 Higgs and, a, and the third generation 16 with a, with a unified common Yukawa coupling Y at the uh, at the gut scale. Well, we certainly know that uh, the top mass and the bottom mass and the tau mass are very different. So how can this, uh, how can this happen? How can we get unification of all these Yukawa couplings at the high scale? So at first, why isn't Yukawa unification on the supersymmetry success list? If you write a big success list, people would talk about gauge coupling unification and dark matter and la la la, various, uh, various things. Uh, the lazy answer is that we're, we're really not sure if it works from several points of view. From, from just the, the, the theory model point of view, there's lots of difficulties with guts. Uh, double, triplet splitting problem and sort of fitting it all work. But there's also this issue of even if I do imagine that every problem is solved at the gut scale, uh, if I need a Yukawa unification, does it really, can it really work? Uh, but there's a, there's a technical answer on this, which is that Yukawa unification is, is more sensitive. I, maybe I overstated it with extremely sensitive, but it's certainly more sensitive to low-scale superpartner masses and, and parameters. And we, we really 
can't have total confidence that your cow unification is, a, is an important part and, and a very appealing part of model building. But that's the bad news. The good news is this extreme sensitivity to low-scale supersymmetry is an opportunity. In gauge coupling, we, we can measure the superpartner masses to four decimal places. We can get the whole spectrum, and we're not going to learn one thing more about gauge coupling unification than we know today if we just assume the supersymmetry exists. Not one thing more. But on Yukawa unification, this, this higher sensitivity really does help us a lot. So that's the good news. So we could, you know, we could wait for superpartner measurements and then revise and, uh, this question of Yukawa unification, or we can start uh, answering the question now and seeing does it fit into other model building approaches and does it have correlating phenomenon that should be looked for at a collider that m people may be missing or not putting enough priority on. Okay, so this is a uh, technical slide. Um, how, uh, how, would, how do you go about computing Yukawa unification? It's uh, gauge coupling unification is a very technical subject. Uh, you do things at two loops, and you have to decouple thresholds at one loop, and you have to do the matching right. You have to do it's a it's a subtle thing. Yukawa unification uh, to do it precisely and to have precise statements made about it is a subtle thing and it has to be done right. You do one thing wrong and everything is off. In gauge coupling unification, if you do one thing wrong, you're okay. And uh, you're sort of about right anyways. In Yukawa unification, you do one thing wrong and your paper is a disaster. And there's papers lying about in the literature that are just disasters. And, uh, and so some years uh, uh, ago, a few years ago, uh, postdoc and I just were frustrated. We were reading some of these papers and said, uh, "This, this, uh, this is outrageous. Uh, I can't. Tr we can't trust anything." There's there's contradictory remarks about all of this everywhere in the literature, and different spectrum and so on. So we, uh, being uh, filled with uh, exuberance, decided to uh, to go about doing this and uh, revisiting this question and and pledging our life, souls, and blood to it to make sure every little piece is right. And, uh, and I think it is right because uh, in one part of what we did, we reproduced very well the answer of somebody that we and I trust quite a bit in the field, Stuart Robbie. So his name will come up later. So his paper was sort of in conflict with other people's papers and so on. And one aspect of our paper was we, we really were able to see that what he did was correct. And, um, and then we have some other stories to say about it. And so I want to tell you a bit of that story. So in gauge coupling unification at the high scale, uh, you can run them up and you can make formulas like this. At some scale m, uh, which is very near... 10 to the 16 GeV, uh, we can look at threshold corrections from the low scale, delta G1. G, G1 is G MSSM minus G standard model over G standard model. And the G MSSM takes into account threshold corrections, so loop corrections of renormalizing the, uh, uh, the uh, gauge couplings. Similarly, there's... Um, there's uh, Threshold, low-scale threshold corrections on Yukawa couplings. There's high-scale uh, corrections from where precisely you define your unification scale. So the success of gauge coupling unification is insensitive, more or less, to weak-scale supersymmetry. The coefficients are not that large in these, in these equations. And, and when, in as much as there are one, one, in as much as there is one large coefficient, it's, uh, it's only one. Uh, so this is a success, and it's rather unambiguous success of supersymmetry, the gauge coupling unification. In Yukawa unification, we have uh, corrections that are rather large. Uh, so this is, the, this is the Yukawa coupling of the top quark. And at the high scale, so I'm going to choose tangent beta equals 50. 
uh, and go near the high scale, and it's uh, g about one times g one, three times g two, three times g three, seven times delta y t. So there's large low scale corrections on the top, large low scale corrections, sort of three one two two, nearly one on the bottom, and and so on. So these these large sensitivities to the one-loop corrections at the weak scale from superpartner masses make this game very difficult to play, to, to have some definitive statements that one can make before supersymmetry uh, discovery <coughs> and measurements. So unification actually is better when delta t is negative. So you can just you can stare at these equations and you can see you can see that the correction for yt if you look at just the naive scaling, yt is just too high. So that's sort of known. I mean, you, you, re- you recognize that because top quark is much higher mass than the bottom quark. As you run up to high scale, they get closer and closer together and sort of can, can unify. But you want a negative correction. And generically, you do get negative corrections from low-scale supersymmetry thresholds. So that's great. So you get this, this one-loop corrections really do knock you down by 10%. So, so that's excellent. And uh, generically, you want the, the B core correction to, to, to be positive. And that is fine. You get finite B core mass corrections that, that do this. I will show that to you in just a minute. But uh, unfortunately, you can't stare at these analytic equations too long because uh, they, they're not as precise as doing things fully numerically, uh, which, is, which is what we've done. So in this plot, is uh, contours of needed uh, corrections to the B quark mass. And I will show you these corrections in just a moment, but just go with me for, for, for the next minute or two. This is sort of one-loop correction to the B quark mass, relative correction to the B quark mass, so it's dimensionless. So that's 6%, 4%, 2%, 12%, etc. So these are contours of needed values of B quark corrections in the plane of assumed values for the top quark correction and the tau correction. Okay? So as I, as I mentioned, and I will show you in the next slide, the top corrections are, are about minus 10% generically over much of parameter space, rather stably, around minus 8 to 10%, so around here. And the tau correction is fairly small. Uh, and this is in the... In the the needed value of tangent beta given uh, values of delta t, delta tau, and the best value for delta b for unification. So I know that's a bit complicated in expressing it verbally, but um, I hope those plots help a bit. So what are the typical sizes of the top and tau corrections? Um, these, these corrections are much more stable than the bottom quark corrections. Um, I, I will, yeah, it's, it's hard to, it's a bit hard to explain why, but it's basically because the top quark is an up-like object, and so it's not sensitive to, to large tangent beta proportional effects. It's just the way the trigonometric uh, features of these corrections go. Whereas the down-type objects, the bottom and the tau, which are both down-type fermions, have many corrections that are proportional to tangent beta. And tangent beta is, needs to be high for this uh, unification to work. But the tau is small. It, the, the overall effects are rather small for the tau compared to the, to the B. So it's only a few percent. And the top is negative and about 10%. So uh, that's the origin of my statement on the previous slide. So these are the expect, given that, these are the expectations for the B quark uh, uh, mass corrections. In the tangent beta plane and delta B, if I want Yukawa unification to work out to within, uh, to within a few percent, I need to be within this box. So less than a 10% correction to the bottom, generically about a 5% correction to the bottom quark mass, and tangent beta of about 50 so keep that in mind because I'm going to show you very shortly 
why this is difficult to swallow. Okay? But this is, this is what you need for triple Yukawa unification. High tangent beta and bottom cork mass correction is only 5%. All right? Okay, so this is where the major problem happens and where all the, the tension lies is getting that B cork mass correction to be small. So, uh, as I say, down type objects have uh, tangent beta dependent corrections at the loop level. And the bottom is, uh, is a strongly interacting particle. If I, uh, and, and so the loop effect is, this relative mass loop effect is G3 squared over 12 pi squared, so it's just one, one loop factor, but with a strong gauge coupling in front, times tangent beta. Tangent beta is 50. So that's like an inverse loop power, and this is a loop power, and so the, the corrections to delta B are order one. You really t generically expect in these very high tangent beta values to have bottom cork mass corrections of 50% or, or larger, so it's generically large effects. Therefore, uh, a, a very basic conclusion uh, is that the B mass corrections must be smaller than naively is expected to allow for third family uh, generation Yukawa unification. And this conclusion survives this very detailed uh, numerical analysis. I tried to sort of hand wave discuss it. And, and this, this formula, of course, is a very crude formula. But, but you do it very detailed and it survives all the detailed uh, corrections, this generic uh, assumption. So another way to phrase this is something has to happen that you don't expect to happen uh, given the rest of the constraints in the theory. Uh, okay, so that, I, I'll skip that. Um, so, what does, so what does this triple unification... So now we're faced with this problem and we need to solve this problem. How do we get the finite B-cork mass corrections to be smaller than naively expected. How do we do that? And we have to do that to make it work. Well, this is, I, I've expanded out the corrections in a slight bit more detail. Last time I, I just I had loop correction times tangent beta. Now I'm putting in these supersymmetry masses. So it scales like mu times m gluina over mb squ squared and mu times at over m uh, uh, the stop mass squared. So if you look at that, you see that, uh, that it was helpful to write it out in somewhat more detail, these expressions, because they're very different symmetry properties of the numerator compared to the denominator. The objects in the, num the, the mass scales in the numerator can be protected effectively by symmetries. This can be protected e effectively by a, a Petit Quinn-like symmetry. So the mu term mass can, can be technically natural, very small compared to the scalar masses. And as we talked about in the last lecture, the gluina mass certainly can be much smaller than the, uh, than the squark masses. And, and we didn't use this term last time, but it's, it's the R symmetries associated with it. An R, an R symmetry can protect the uh, gageno masses to be much smaller than the scalar masses. And there's no such protection for the scalar masses. And uh, the A term, this is, uh, transforms non-trivially under R symmetry as well. So there's no, so this is sort of an R symmetry protecting these two, a Petit Quinn symmetry can protect these two. So it's not a problem to get this hierarchy to be very, very small. So I can, I can effectively ha add another loop suppression by this kind of uh, symmetry argument. So I have, instead of having loop times in, uh, times a huge tangent beta factor, I have loop, loop times tangent beta. You can easily do that. So, um, so that is, uh, that's a symmetry way of looking at it. One can just be brute force and do it, which is what some of the literature does. But now, okay, so I've done that. I can, su I can suppress a bit, uh, and I can have, oh, by the way, I can have a cancellation. And, I, and, and there's a fair amount of the literature that arranges this to cancel that. 
Because people don't like large hierarchies. They don't like scalar masses being very heavy. And if you don't want to make a loop factor here, then you have to cancel this with that. So manufacturing a cancellation between those two terms to make a finite B-quark mass correction has been a part of the game for some time. But I think that there's a major problem with that approach. And the major problem is that the finite B-quark mass correction is really not much different than a B decay to, uh, to a strange quark in a photon. So, uh, so I, I look at... I look at this graph and I, and I see something that's very similar to a, to a B quark mass correction. So a B quark mass correction is a B quark here, a B quark there, and then a Higgs boson coming in with an X somewhere. And so I, I sort of shift the X a little bit and I put a strange quark there and I attach a photon, but it's really not much different. I mean, of course, I'm being very glib, but, but, really, but the symmetry properties are very similar. There's chiral clashing arrows, there's mass insertions, etc. So, uh, with ten, this chiral clashing arrows of a left and a, a left and a right, with down type fermions, if you see that in a diagram, you know that there's a tangent beta running around in the numerator, always. So, so down type objects with chiral clashing arrows gives you a tangent beta. And, it, and if the tangent beta is large, which it needs to be in this triple Yukawa uni unification, then it annihilates a loop factor. And so this has the strength of a tree, essentially the strength of a tree level decay, naively. A tree level contribution to B to S gamma compared to the standard model one loop decay of B to S gamma is untenable. So the, this, this conspiracy on the previous slide between these two terms by no means will translate into a conspiracy for this operator, which is morally equivalent operator as far as this is concerned. And so I think this is, um, uh, this is a, a disquieting aspect of a cancellation. But uh, this was done, uh, sort of the work of Blazek, Dermasek, and Rabi was done uh, uh, sort of before uh, lots of different things were uh, known data-wise and some theory analyses were done. And, uh, and they did an excellent, excellent work. And they found similar things. They found tangent beta of about 50 is needed. So that's been known for some time. Uh, they also wanted a small suppression uh, it's not, not quite a loop factor. It wasn't a huge, huge difference in it, but, but a difference between the matter multiplets. It's either, these are the squark masses versus the gay genome masses in mu terms. So it's exactly what we described in the last few slides. Uh, they wanted a large A term and positive charge stop contributions of blah, you know, all this, and that's that cancellation aspect. So they're, they're using aspects of all of it, sort of a cancellation. They're using aspects of... of um, uh, of this uh, suppression factor. And, and then they said, uh, which was quite popular up till very, very recently to, to consider, is that, yes, there is a large contribution to B to S gamma, uh, but if the contribution is really large, then I can just flip the sign of the amplitude. So the standard model has one side. I add to the amplitude a non-standard model with the opposite sign, and I just make it so large that it's the same magnitude, but, but, uh, but opposite sign. And uh, there's nothing in the beta S gamma experiments that would say that that is a wrong, uh, wrong idea. This is, uh, th th this is another way of expressing it. This coefficient, I should, I should state right here, the coefficient of this operator, which is mediating this decay, so you can imagine integrating all this and making an effective operator, this coefficient uh, is a, the so-called Wilson coefficient C7 for B decays. So, and B to S gamma in supersymmetry, you can write as the standard model calculation of the branching fraction of B to S gamma times 1 plus 0.45 times C7 effective. This really should say effective on top. 
over C7 standard model. So the experiment, oh, oh sorry, no, no, that, this is correct. I already inserted the effective part. This is one plus delta C7, so the new physics contributions to the C7 diagram over a C7 standard model. So therefore, since the experiment is nicely consistent with the standard model to within 10 or 15 percent, we need the new contributions to be either zero or so large that the whole sign changes. So flipping the sign of the amplitude uh, can work, and it's, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a possibility that's real and was exploited by, uh, by BDR in their approach. Um, and as I say, I, I have this problem of uh, this so-called fine-tuned cloaking of large tangent beta effects between finite B quark mass and, uh, uh, and B to S gamma. Um, ah, before I describe that solution, I should give you an update on this. It turns out that flipping the sign does not work. It's very, unlike, very unlikely to work. Recent, I talked to an expert just this last week to get an update on it, somebody who's been following the LHC B data. And, and uh, the way you test for it is looking at B to S, L plus, L minus. Because the photon can be off shell and make an L plus, L minus. And there's other contributions, actually, a box diagram contributions to B to S, L plus, L minus. And so that there's a different linear combination of operators that contributes to one decay versus the other. And you look at the, in, the invariant uh, mass spectrum of L plus L minus in the energy spectrum, and it's not consistent with a flipping of the sign of C7. So that solution is, uh, is, is no longer, is probably no longer viable. Uh, so, so there's another solution, which is, uh, you can anticipate, given our discussion, is that we can suppress both the finite B quark mass corrections and B to S gamma by considering very massive scalars, by having this hierarchy, this, this one-loop hierarchy between the R-symmetric and peche quinn symmetric masses versus the scalar masses. And the main minus of this is the one that we've we've been uh, considering is that electroweak symmetry breaking is more tuned uh, because you have these heavy scalar masses which, which translate to heavier masses in the Higgs potential. And the main plus is that flavor changing neutral currents and CP violating observables are okay or are, are, are less problematic. And furthermore, I mean, most importantly for this exercise, we're able to get uh, tri unification of the Yukawa couplings. So in our framework, M tilde scalar masses are a loop level higher, or about a loop level higher than the Gaginos A terms and mu. And, uh, and this, is, this harks back to our previous lecture. It's leading us in a similar direction. It's, uh, uh, if supersymmetry breaking is charged, then you don't get this type of interaction. You get uh, one loop suppressed factor, and that, uh, uh, this anomaly mediated like interaction, can be the one that gives the Gagino masses, and the scalar masses are roughly the, the uh, uh, gravitino mass. And we have the spectrum that may just work for, uh, for Yukawa unification. So various pieces are coming together uh, of this approach, I think. So let's be technical about it. Uh, let's uh, choose a, a spectrum of, of 150 GeV for the, for the Wino, and the Gluino is, is 1.3 TeV, so that's certainly out of reach of LHC7. LHC7 has no hope for finding 1.3 TeV. And the Gravitino mass is near 600 GeV in this, um, uh, in this case. Actually, it's, uh, no, it's higher than that, but anyways. For given value of mu and m susi, we can compute the value of tangent beta such that this quantity epsilon is minimized. It's, it's a uh, uh, et cyclic error function on tri-unification of the Yukawa couplings. So yb minus y tau over yb, yt minus y tau over yt, yt minus yb over yt, computed at the gut scale. 
Of course, if this is all zero, then you have perfect Yukawa unification. So let's plot contours of constant epsilon and look at where we need to be in parameter space to have less than 5%, uh, epsilon being less than 5%. So, so very reasonable requirement for, for unification. And here is that plot. So the two most important parameters are, are the mu term and m susi. And you see that there's a sliver of 5% values uh, all throughout this region, tri unification of the cow couplings is okay. Everywhere else, it's not. There's a large hierarchy, large masses for M. Susi, and the, uh, the Gijino masses were light. Uh, the Gijino masses were, as I said from the previous slide, uh, yeah, 150 GeV for M2. So, large, large hierarchy again, and then it works. B to S gamma, so now you ask, well, is B to, B to S gamma okay? Yes, it's perfectly fine. These are contours of, of the new prediction of B to S gamma over the standard model prediction uh, in this plane. And recall tangent beta is 50, so the generic thing is to have a large contribution from new physics. So one has to go greater than 1.7 TeV for scalar superpartner masses to be within 15% of the standard model contribution. But that's fine. There's uh, plenty of parameter space out here where B to S gamma and other observables, B to S L plus L minus and so on, work out, work out to be just fine. But the point is that you, you will, it's, it's highly unlikely that anything like tri-unification of, um, of the Yukawas will work unless you have this hierarchical sort of split-like supersymmetric spectrum, and, uh, and the heavier superpartners being greater than at least several TeV. Uh, there's, a, there's a small effect on G minus two of the muon, so that there might be indications of new physics there, but the uncertainties of the calculation are rather large. It gives a positive contribution to G minus two, which is in the right direction, but it's not, uh, not substantive. Okay, um, so this uh, so it's highly dependent on on the weak scale threshold corrections. What we were able to do with Yukawa unification is something again that we were just simply not able to do with with gauge coupling unification, and that is put very strict requirements on the low energy superpartner spectra. Now with gauge coupling unification, the high energy spectrum. Uh, had a lot of effect on what was possible and what was not for gauge, gauge coupling unification, because you can imagine much more violence up there. What about the high scale threshold corrections for U Yukawa unification? And there, it's generally held in the literature that the high scale thresholds are less of, a, of an issue. And you can sort of understand why, because a, U a Yukawa coupling is really only affecting one operator. And as you, whereas a gauge coupling is lots of different states, you add different states in, those different states then contribute to the quantum corrections of that, of that coupling. If you have a Yukawa coupling and an operator here and you throw in a lot of states over there that are doing all sorts of things, it doesn't matter to that Yukawa coupling except for indirectly or higher loop. So you, re you generically get small gut scale uh, corrections the much more worrisome thing, and, and, and this is where an interesting accident happens, a much more worrisome thing is um, what about neutrino masses at, a, at some intermediate scale? And, and uh, if you have a third generation uh, sort of Yukawa coupling uh, associated with neutrinos, they can feed into this um, top court corrections with a logarithm of m gut over m to the 13 GeV. And it turns out that those effects are only about 4%, and they're in the direction of delta t and delta tau being, this, being the same. And if you look at all these equations carefully and look at some of the plots, you'll see that the impact on delta b is very, very minimal as long as the corrections to delta t and delta tau are, are, are the same along some line. So high-scale threshold corrections are really not causing much of a problem for, uh, for our, our, our analysis. It's, it's, it's robust to that. 
Okay, now, you are string theorists, many of you. And uh, you have probably heard in the literature claims that uh, uh, SO10, uh, SO10 stringy guts and SO10 was, uh, had a prediction of a top mass of 175 GeV or 180 GeV. And it wasn't a literature prediction. It was in the literature well before the top quark mass was, was found that, that the top mass should be 175 GeV. And this is an extraordinary accident of uh, a theory meets something. Um, and I want to try to explain to you why it's not a really robust uh, prediction. Um, that prediction was derived in the days before people really thought about and understood the finite B quark mass corrections, as I've explained before. It's not that they were wrong or sloppy. It's just they just didn't think of it. You know, there's there's progression in every field, and and uh, nobody would have thought that there was some huge order one correction to the B quark mass from some high high superpartner masses, right? So I think it's you can cut them some slack. Um, it was all done before my time as a particle physicist, so I. Uh, I will be magnanimous and, and grant them absolution. But it's, uh, it was derived assuming that the B quark mass corrections were zero. And it's an accident that all this works and can only work really when the B quark finite corrections are, are, are nearly zero. But if you assumed it at the beginning and said that's just the way it is, and then you made a prediction for what the top quark mass uh, needed to be, you would have got 100 and about 180 GeV. Actually, if you, if you, so I, I, I did this exercise where I made a prediction of what the top quark mass needed to be given an a priori assumption of the finite B quark mass corrections. And it was a little over 180 if it was zero, and then it goes all the way down to 100 if it's about 25%. So if in the old days, before people knew anything about you know, what the actual top quark mass was and so on, if they said, uh, well, generically we have order 50% or 25% corrections to the, to the bottom quark mass, they would have put themselves on this plot here and would have said, ah, I predict the top quark mass to be about 110 to 130 GeV. So, so it's, it's neglecting a factor leading to a prediction which was not justified. So, um, yeah, that's, that's semi-repeat. Semi okay, so uh, I will move on to the next uh, part of the discussion. This is just repeating what I said, that it's highly sensitive to low-scale superpartner spectrum, and therefore we, from, from the low, if, if, if supersymmetry is found, we can take a look at the spectrum and we can very clearly state if Yukawa unification with a desert works. A very, very, uh, well, we can clearly rule it out. Uh, precisely working is a little bit more difficult. Okay, so now, I, so in the last uh, 20 minutes or, or so, I want to go back to gauge coupling unification. So there's an interesting story there and uh, that string theorists need to know uh, and feel uh, facile with. Uh, we saw that uh, the gauge couplings do not unify exactly when applying only IR considerations. And of course, we, we don't expect it. We expect high-scale threshold corrections. And from the minimal SU5 point of view, we can, we, we can illustrate how important non-renormalizable operators are. And, I, and I, I'm going to illustrate to you high-scale threshold corrections, claims in the literature, uh, ways around, and non-renormalizable operator effects, and then how it affects the spectrum. Okay? And maybe one of your models, your, one of your explanations of everything will, uh, will need to take this into account, these kinds of things. A few years ago, it was stated that minimal SU5 is dead, which was a very sad day for, uh, 
uh, for uh, people because uh, it, it's the simplest grand unified theory. You can put all the matter multiplets in a 10 plus 5 bar, and then if you want a right-handed neutrino, it's a, there's a singlet. And then the gauge sector is a 24, and then there's an adjoint Higgs, a 24, and then there's a 5 plus 5 bar Higgs. That is the minimal SU5 theory. And the high-scale threshold corrections come from massive components of these representations, the, the vector representation MV, the sigma... Um, adjoint uh, gauge representation. And then in the 5 and 5 bar of Higgs, there are, there's the doublet. Higgs up and Higgs down is embedded in those two. And then the, the triplet, the remaining triplet, is the, is the so-called uh, Higgs triplet of grand unified theories. And that's the one where, this is where the doublet-triplet splitting problem comes from, because that triplet mediates proton decay, but it can't have a mass near the doublet mass uh, has to have a, a, a very split mass compared to doublet mass. So somehow, by hook or crook or fine-tuning or something, this triplet mass is very, very, very heavy. And that's fine. We just assume it. That's part of the minimal SU5 description. So gauge coupling running. Well, uh, the, the gauge coupling I at some scale, uh, at some high scale, is the grand unified value plus some delta. These delta functions are the threshold corrections due to heavy gut states. And they are, uh, the, you, this, these B are coefficients to beta functions and MA are the masses. And for, uh, for the uh, U1 gauge coupling, the threshold correction is proportional to the, of course, the specter mass and the triplet mass, and a different uh, combination for the SU2 gauge coupling and the SU3 coupling. So they all have different, slightly different contributions from the high scale threshold corrections to, to gauge coupling unification. So now, the Higgs triplet, there's, there's one linear combination where you can really pick out the Higgs triplet, and it's this one right here. Minus 1 over g1 squared plus 3 over g2 squared minus 2 over g3 squared. So that is only sensitive to the triplet, uh, the triplet threshold correction. We can evaluate this at the unification scale, and g1 is equal to g2 at the unification scale by definition. This is how we define it. And we get this equation. 1 over g squared equals 1 over g3 equals that. Now, Delta U depends mildly on low-scale superpartner masses, but it's always within 1 times 10 to the 16th and 2 times 10 to the 16th. With small, it takes a lot to get out of this range for superpartner masses at the TV scale or below. Okay, so this is so we have we have this equation now that isolates the triplet Higgs mass. The triplet Higgs mass is. Is, is ultimately what's going to, uh, to be our problem. Now, we know from our previous discussion that G3 at the unification scale is less than GU, albeit by, by not much. It's only about a percent difference. This implies that the left-hand side of this equation is necessarily negative. So, so that is negative. So... If the left-hand side is from higher mathematics, uh, the right-hand side of the equation better be negative. And the only way the right-hand side of the equation can be negative is if the triplet Higgs is less than the, the unification scale. So the triplet Higgs from, gauge, from exact gauge coupling unification of minimal SU5, and, and we can do exact unification because we are specifying the high scale. So we can't hide behind... Uh, cloudy visions of the high scale. This is, this is our theory, mental SU5. We are testing and we are, we are making calculations on our theory. The triplet Higgs has to be less than 10 to the 16th for exact gauge coupling unification period. Now, this is in conflict. It's in conflict with this diagram right here. The H triplet Higgs mediates proton decay. And if the superpartner mass spectrum is below a TeV or, or close to a TeV, 
then that triplet really has to be above 10 to the 17 GeV. And you say, well, it's only, it's only one, 16 versus 17 in the exponent. Maybe we can get away with it. And I, but you can't get away with it. It's, uh, there is a conflict. And the conflict is, is enough to, to have a paper published saying mineral SG5 is dead. Which I think was a very clever paper, and it just forced the issue on, uh, on people. Uh, but there's two ways out of it. One way out of it is these scalar masses that are addressing the operator or that are addressing the proton decay, uh, these, these two masses are very heavy, much higher than the TeV scale, in which case I can get an extra order of magnitude suppression and I can have the triplet mass be 10 to the 16th, less than 10 to the 16th, and still be okay with proton decay. But I need to raise these up really high but that's okay. And if you buy into this PEV scale or split SUSY scenario, that's okay, and you can do it. But there's another uh, approach, or actually a realization, and that is that you expect gravity to induce one over n Planck uh, connections to all of these states. So there's uh, the first operator here is uh, let's go ahead and assume some singlet breaking of supersymmetry. And this is that, that insertion, and you get your gauge kinetic function, you get supersymmetry breaking, mass scales out, uh, your gauge genome mass, et cetera. So it's all, everything works. But then you have this 24 Higgs connected to, uh, to the WW. The 20, it's actually fine to have the adjoint connecting to this WW. Um, this, this, uh, this part leads to a common gauge, uh, gauge couplings, right? It's just a singlet, and so there's a unified gauge coupling at that high scale. This, since it's an adjoint, will split apart the gauge couplings a bit at the high scale and creates a non-renormalizable uh, contribution to gauge coupling splittings at the high scale. So it's not the same as a particle running around in a loop. It's just a higher order operator with a VEV inserted, creating a splitting. And this, the gut symmetry is broken by a vacuum expectation value of this, of this adjoint down the diagonal of two-thirds, 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 minus one, minus one. And you plug that in, and you get shifts in the gauge, in the gauge couplings. And here they are. So now I have to augment this first equation of, uh, that I showed a few slides ago with this plus CI epsilon, where epsilon is the overall VEV of the adjoint over n Planck times 8 times some arbitrary coupling out front. This Y is some arbitrary unspecified coupling because you don't know order 1 coefficients. And CI, uh, the coefficients uh, for the U1, SU2, and SU3 couplings are minus a third, minus, minus 1, and 2 thirds. Uh, so now we can recompute that combination that isolated out the triplet mass. So we now we, do, we, we redo the computation, and we get the same formula that we got before, except for now there's a minus 2 epsilon there. So the epsilons did not cancel out. That minus 2 epsilon is extremely important in this because I can now absorb it into... A, an effective triplet mass from the point of view of gauge coupling unification where the effective triplet mass is equal to the real triplet mass times the exponent of minus 20 pi squared epsilon over 3. So the real, the, the real triplet mass is what comes into uh, to proton decay. So let's let that be greater than 10 to the 17 GeV. That's fine. That's not a problem. The effective one is what comes into the gauge coupling unification analysis. And all I need is epsilon to be a few percent, and we can have this, uh, uh, the real one being greater than 10 to 17 and the effective gauge coupling one being less than 10 to the 16. Exactly what we need for exact Yukawa unification. And all we need is epsilon of a few percent. Epsilon of a few percent is not a problem because it's just VEV over, where is my epsilon? Uh, it's just VEV over M Planck. Yeah, here it is. 
If the Vev is 10 to the 16 and in Planck is 10 to the 18 with some you know, arbitrary order one coefficient in front, a few percent is exactly what you would expect. So, so this creates actually an additional concern about exact unification. It almost doesn't matter. Uh, I mean, from a field theorist's point of view, you're, if a field theorist comes to you and says, I've proven exact gauge coupling unification, I know how to, to show it, be highly, highly skeptical. Because no effective field theorist is going to know what to do with in Planck operators. And in Planck operators are, play an equivalently important role as high scale threshold corrections do for gauge coupling unification. This is very serious a fact that you have to take into account. So it's, it, it will be required to have a deeper theory that gives all the operators, the renormalizable and non-renormalizable operators, before you can say something really definitive about gauge coupling unification. And my attitude about gauge coupling unification is that I, I believe it at some level. I, I believe in unification. I think it's there. Uh, but we will be a long ways away both theoretically and experimentally in, um, in, in establishing that nature has really chosen it. And we will need to piece together a full story about that, proton decay and other things. Uh, so I, just to show you, there's some plots uh, that we had made some time ago about uh, triplet Higgs mass and epsilon. And you only need a few percent and, and low scale uh, masses uh, of supersymmetry work perfectly fine for it. Okay, but you can't stop there. And the imprint of this is an interesting imprint. So uh, if you have uh, symmetry breaking in your theory, uh, it's hard, it, it, it's sort of unnatural and strange for symmetry breaking to happen only along a scalar component of a chiral, of a chiral superfield, if we want to phrase it that way. It, it's, a, it's not obvious that it should happen along that way. It's generically, symmetry breaking should happen in, super, in, in some direction in superspace. If you think about the Higgs boson of, uh, of minimal supersymmetry, so think, think about electroweak symmetry breaking. Electroweak symmetry breaking uh, gives a VEV to the Higgs, Higgs up and Higgs down, but it also contributes to, uh, to supersymmetry breaking. You cannot give a VEV to the Higgs without an F term value, and that F term value is proportional to the mu term. So, uh, so the same thing happens here. Uh, you can't really expect to find only a VEV in the scalar direction, but also in super, you expect it in superspace. So I'm going to write down F sub sigma. And uh, I'm breaking supersymmetry, I'm breaking the gauge group by this, but I look at the full superpotential of the theory, and it's this complicated thing, and the soft Lagrangian is this uh, that you can derive from it is here. And then I turn the crank and I minimize potential, just like I, just like I do in any uh, field theory. And, um, and I find that the, the F term has to have a non-zero value, uh, unless there's a conspiracy of A, A minus B being equal to zero. But it's the VEV times the difference in the A terms. These are soft supersymmetry breaking mass terms, A and B. Uh, it's, the F term is proportional to that. And you say, well, okay, so who cares? There's a small contribution uh, to the F term. Um, we expect that. It's okay. But go back to this operator. If I have a, a non-zero F term in this operator, it's going to affect the gauge masses. So the scalar component affected and split up the gauge couplings, but the F term splits up the, uh, the gauge so there, so there can be an imprint of this kind of non-renormalizable operator on the Gaginos. And uh, I will spare the, the details, but this is the, this is the imprint on the Gaginos masses at the low scale. 
and I'll just go straight to a to a figure of it, and if uh, and depending on how much correction from this non-renormalizable operator one gets, you get a sh- different shifts between the SU3 and SU2 gauge nodes versus the SU2 and U1 gauge nodes. And it's careful measurement of these gauge masses plus other elements of the story can help piece together what kind of grand unified theory you might have, what kind of imprint from higher order operators are, are uh, putting on your low energy spectrum. Okay, so um, just very briefly, I, I wanted to show you that these, these are things that are happening today uh, on the Yukawa unification front. On the, gauge, on the gauge coupling unification front, there's always papers every week. And uh, almost every week, there's some interesting thing to say that's related to gauge coupling unification somehow. On Yukawa unification, there was a paper just this last week um, where they are talking about heavier gluino masses and TB tau unification. Everything they say in this paper is consistent and, uh, and actually overlaps with what I presented here. Um, and they have a spectrum of, of, of particle masses, detailed spectrum of particle masses, which as advertised is the kind of thing that you get out when you worry in detail about TBAL, TB tau unification. Okay, so my last slide. Uh, general lesson, high-scale hypotheses can have very significant effect on low-scale phenomena. Even subtle hypotheses like non-renormalizable operators that, that uh, just show up at the Planck scale can have this important effect on the uh, Yukawa unification and on gauge coupling unification and gauge mass uh, hierarchies. Uh, triunification in particular leaves a distinct and compelling implication on the low energy spectrum and the spectrum needed, uh, actually, in that particular case, may look like split SUSI or partial split SUSI, independent of the Higgs, independent of the Higgs boson uh, mass issues. Okay, so I'll uh, leave it there. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks very much for the wonderful lectures. Uh, it's not the last lecture, though, sorry. Yeah, the, the last lecture I'm going to uh, talk about a very generic hidden sectors of, motivated by hidden sectors of string theory. And how would you go about finding something totally hidden at the LHC? And uh, hope. I had a question about nomenclature. You mentioned anomaly mediation. What, what do you mean exactly by that? Is that uh, assuming that this prion is charged? Or uh, could you clarify? Yeah, so, so if the spurion, if the, if the normal supersymmetry breaking uh, multiplet that describes it is charged, then the leading contribution to the supersymmetry breaking would be, would be a normally mediated contribution, this loop correction contribution. Whereas gauge mediation would be? Ah, so gauge mediation is a different kind of uh, loop correction. It's you have uh, intermediate particles that uh, are gauge messengers that feel supersymmetry breaking. And so you, you make two loop diagrams that, that feed in supersymmetry breaking into the... And I, unfortunately, I haven't had time to talk uh, about gauge-mediated supersymmetry breaking. It's something I'm even working on right now. Uh, and so I, I was tempted to talk about that, but uh, I had no time. Okay. Uh, please, please. You just your microphone. Uh, could, could, could there be some gravitational effect similar to the one you, you showed for the SU5 gauge cap unification, also for the SO10 Yukawa unification in principle? Yes, there but, there, but there's uh, small... This would affect your conclusion? Yeah, it, it, it doesn't affect it much. And, and I base that mostly, you know, Stuart Robbie had built, hun- I don't know, maybe hundreds of SO10 models or something. And... Uh, and he showed in very painful detail that those corrections are small from, uh, from these higher order effects. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So uh, for, for uh, Yukawa unification, you've convinced us you need tan beta to be about 50. But earlier on in your split supersymmetry work, for getting a Higgs mass of 125, you mentioned tan beta equals 2. 
Uh, yes, f- 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 yes. If, if it's 10 to the 6th, then tangent beta 2 works, yeah. But there would be no tri Yukawa unification in that case at all, yeah. yeah. Right. And let me just make one more comment about this. It's, it's semi obvious, so he did it in sort of painful detail, but it's semi obvious why there's a big difference between gauge coupling and Yukawa unification uh, at the high scale. Here, there, was, there, there are not many representations that you can connect to the WW and make it gauge invariant. And it's the same way with the Yukawa unification. There's the 16, the 10, the 16. So in most of these grand unified models, there's not another representation that you can just add to it, make a non renormalizable operator, and it has a VEV. That will, you need to go to higher order, exactly. So you have to go to much higher order as so you get pl- by multiple Planck masses suppression, VEVs over multiple Planck masses. Yeah. Okay. Well, we have more time for questions this afternoon at 5 p.m. in this very room with James. And there will be also a, a tutorial with Marcus Marino in the TH conference room uh, upstairs from the secretaries. In the meantime, let's thank uh, James again.